So I'm Nick Prococo, and this is Christian, and you're at, this is not the droid you're looking for. Okay. Is that better? Okay, so what you see on the screen is the agenda. We're not going to really talk through it because you're going to see it in the next 50 minutes. But, um, but basically, this is what we're going to talk through today, and let's just jump into the introduction here. So a little bit about me. Um, like I said, I'm Nick Prococo. I'm the um, Senior Vice President and Head of Spider Labs at Trustwave. About 15 years InfoSec experience. I actually built and, and still lead the Spider Labs team at Trustwave. Some of my interests, targeted malware, attack prevention, you know, mobile devices, and really from a business and social impact analysis standpoint. And, and this is Christian here. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Christian Papathanasiu. Uh, I'm a security consultant at Trustwave based out of London. I've got eight years uh, in InfoSec. Um, my interests are within rootkits, anti-rootkit detection, um, algorithmic trading, which is more financial related, related, and web application security. Okay, so a little, little bit of background in your introduction here. So basically, I'm sure everybody here knows what Android is, and that's probably why you're here. Um, you know, it's you know, 60,000 or 100,000. I don't know how many phones are being sold or activated on a daily basis. It's a very popular platform. Um, from what we were able to find, it ranks about number four in the, in, in the, in the, in the in the handset or the, the mobile device, um, your rankings there. So I guess we'll show of hands. How, how many people here in the room have Android phones? Wow. <laughs> okay, you guys are all fucked. <laughs> no, not really. We're, we're just gonna drop you down a few levels and we'll bring you back up. At the end of this year, I'll be hugging each other. So. Um, <laughs> So basically, you know, not much research here. You know, we, we were able to find um, has been really done in the in the mobile rootkit area, and so there there's some that's been out there. But basically, you know, Android equals Linux equals you know almost a 20 year old operating system. I remember back when I was you know in, in school, freshman in college, um, installing a very early version of Linux from a big stack of floppy disks, compiling the kernel for about eight or 12 hours, and then to find out it actually didn't work. Um, but, maybe it's, you know, but, but because of that, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, um, that it's 20 years old, there's a very established body of knowledge around Linux rootkits. And so we were able to find a lot of information that helped us sort of on our journey here. And so what, what did we do? We, we created a kernel level Android rootkit. Um, it's, it's a loadable kernel module, and it basically is activated or triggered by a, by a phone number, um, so an inbound phone call. So a little bit of background, just, you know, this is a real nice pretty picture here when we, we pulled this from Google. This is basically the model um, for the stack um, that, that, that Android runs on. So basically at the bottom, you see the kernel level, you know, Linux kernel. And at the top, you see the applications. And when I look at this, I sort of think of Time Machine. Um, and and not, the, not the Mac OS, you know, backup utility. I sort of think of the Time Machine, the book, you know, the book or the movie. Um, basically at the top, you have the Eloy. Right, you know, that's, you know, the Eloys are up there, and then and the Morlocks are down at the Linux kernel. Um, the Eloys are like Facebook and Twitter, and, and they're all excited about that, but they don't see anything below the surface, and they don't know what's going on down there. Um, we'll get a little bit more more on that later, but basically, this is what this looks like, and we're going to walk through some of these layers with you. So basically, the Linux kernel um, that's that's the base level there. It's based on the Linux 2.6 kernel. Um, it is a hardware abstraction layer, so everything above it doesn't have to worry about the hardware, right? Everything's just represented as a file. Um, makes, it, makes it very, very nice and very clean for, for everything that's above it. Um, it offers the same things that every other Linux kernel offers, you know, memory management, process management, security, networking. Um, but then the whole Android platform that we're going to be talking about really sits um, on top of that kernel. Um, this is where we focused our, focused our attention in the research. You know, we didn't really focus at the, the application layer. Um, we focused at the, um, at the kernel level. The libraries are where most of Android's core functionality lies. Uh, lies. The main libraries of interest are SQLite, which is the main storage subsystem. Um, so Android uses uh, SQLite databases for storing its messages, its contact database, um, and anything really that it needs to store is stored in SQLite databases. Um, for browsing, uh, it uses the WebKit library. Uh, and crypto is handled by the SSL library. So one thing that is interesting uh, based on the libraries that are used is that because it's a SQLite database, you can read, uh, you can, if you have root access on the device, you can actually read the uh, SMS messages uh, by just using the SQLite cl client. Um, another idea or slash hint is that you can intercept browser sessions by hijacking the library. You can also do that through the kernel. 
And because it's using SSL, uh, the SSL library, uh, and that requires it to be seeded with a prime random, uh, prime uh, random number generator, um, you can see that with static low numbers, and that would mean that your cryptos basically can be cracked easily. So Android's runtime uh, run environment is the Dalvik VM. Um, what is Dalvik? Well, it's a virtual machine on Android devices. It um, runs applications um, which are converted in DEX format. The DEX format is um, specifically designed for um, low memory, low processor speed uh, devices, just like your phone. We didn't spend much time here. The application layer is where your user applications lie, like your Facebook app, your Twitter app, your browser. Um, it's, they usually either come with a phone or they are installed with your market app downloaded from the internet. Um, we didn't spend much time here either. So all your higher layer, layer applications, they ultimately interface with the Linux kernel, um, which acts like a hardware abstraction layer between the um, hardware and your user Linux applications. Therefore, by hijacking the Linux kernel, you, in effect, hijack the higher layer applications. Um, the and then, it, basically, this is where we sort of start to explore, um, you know, the, the, the concept of sort of abstracting um, the, the the rest of the phone, the rest of the functionality of that phone from the end user. So basically, you know, if if you're if you're abstracting everything below the application layer from the end user, that's a usability advantage, right? So your grandma that's using a phone isn't seeing you know you know council messages and things popping up on their screen and all, all sorts of crazy stuff going on. You know, all they know is that they can make a phone call, they can send a text message, they can read their email, and they don't have to learn worry about anything else below. And that's that's great. I mean, that's that's great for a consumer device. Um, but then, complete abs user abstraction in, in that form is basically a s somewhat a security disadvantage, right? Um, if someone's on your phone, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna show what that looks like. But if someone's on your phone, doing things at the at the kernel level, you have no idea. I mean, you really don't know. I mean, you, you, I mean, I have a phone here, and someone could be on it right now, and I wouldn't know by looking at the screen or using my apps. So that's that's a security disadvantage. And then even if an attack, like an attacker is sloppy, they get on a phone and they are causing problems, they, they, it causes it to slow down and now you have to reboot it, the end user is not going to think, well, well, maybe a hacker's on my phone. Um, they're basically going to think that the phone is, is crappy, I need to just reboot it. So, um, so basically they'll just call it a bug or they'll just reboot their phone and they'll be, and they'll be done with it. So, so what are some of the motivations behind this? So, you know, p people are asking, you know, you know, why did you guys look into this? Why did you guys, you know, write the, the rootkit? And, and basically, this was just sort of a, you know, a, a discussion that, that Christian and I had at, um, at Black Hat Europe, um, talking about sort of the implications of someone um, of rootkits being on mobile phones. I mean, mobile phones are everywhere, right? So these, you know, four four hundred eighty-five million devices on three G networks. So that basically means that there are that many devices that almost have an always-on connection, right? So you know, my phone's sitting on my table; um, it's connected to the internet. You know, it's, it's on the it's on the three G network. Um, I, I go and I drive across town while I'm in the car; it's on there as well. So it's always on, um, which is very similar to what we saw in the you know in the late '90s when people started getting always on connections in, in their home. Um, and some research that we, we, we looked into uh, showing that by 2010 there'll be 10 billion devices um, on high speed, always active on online connections. So. You know that's 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 an incredible growth. You know that's that's it's much faster than you even saw when when, when the PC revolution or the or the, the you know internet revolution took place. I mean, people have, some people have two and three mobile devices that are that are on um, 3G networks. Um, and then the other piece there is that 60% of us, you know, maybe even higher, probably you know much higher percentage of the people in this room, um, carry those devices with them at all times. So if you think about, you know, you, you have your home computer, right? You don't carry, well, you may, you may have a laptop, but if you had a home PC and you, it's plugged into your, your home network, you're not carting that thing around with you um, wherever you go. Um, you, know, you know, there's people who probably take their, their phones to the bathroom with them. Um, you probably don't take your PC to the bathroom with you. Um, so basically for high profile and business people, you know, even, even government officials, you know, they probably have that phone with them like, nearly 100% of the time. I know myself personally, I don't think I've had a smartphone leave a two foot perimeter um, from me or maybe a little bit further in probably the last five years. So um, think, of the, think of the implications of someone gaining access to that phone and doing things like turning on um, a camera or listening to a conversation or, 
or, or doing things, other things like that. So, and then the other piece there, the powerful, the, the power nature of, of the smartphone, right? You know, you know, the phone that you have in your pocket today is probably much more powerful than a PC from eight years ago, um, you know, or at least the average PC. And so the other, you know, the location of where PCs is, is there as well. You know, you, you can go wherever you want and there's GPS on there and, and, and someone could possibly track you. So there are piece, other little motivations here is that users access highly sensitive information from their smartphones. Uh, I mean, how many people here have, have done a single um, sort of financial transaction from their phone that may, may be checking their balance on their bank account or doing something from their, from their smartphone? Oh, we got a handful of people here. Um, and then users typically would trust their smartphones before they would trust like a, another computer, right? I know I would, I, would, I would trust my phone before I would trust like a kiosk at a, at a hotel um, to, to make a transaction or do something. Um, they, you don't really ever tr question the, your phone's integrity, um, but in many cases you don't have any ability, as an end user, you don't have ability to, to interrogate the integrity of your phone. I mean, you get to sit on your desk and you walk away and go to the bathroom, you come back, you, you don't really worry that someone got on your phone while you were gone. Um, and Another motivation for this work is that um, lots of times for mobile operators to operate within a certain jurisdiction, they must allow governmental entities access to subscriber information. Um, a, a recent case scenario is in uh, the UAE where a company called Edi Salat uh, pushed a performance update to all their BlackBerry subscribers. Uh, this in essence was um, malware which was intentionally um, installed uh, to allow Etis government officials to monitor BlackBerry users. So BlackBerry users are, in, uh, are likely going to be uh, governmental officials or high-ranking executives or business uh, execs. So that was the purpose. So that, that motivation, um, instead of having, instead of an attacker installing it, we're looking also at a governmental entity or a, C or a communications service provider installing the rootkit on the actual phone and providing it to you shipped. So a bit about what we're not doing here. So what we haven't done is developed a new attack vector to get the rootkit on the phone. And so you know, basically there's a lot of, you know, even people who were here at the previous presentation, there were some, some, some notes about that as well. Um, you know, we're, we're not, we're not, in, we're not, we're not showing, you know, you're not going to be, you know, weaponized um, to be able to attack everybody's phones here at, here at DEF CON after this talk. Um, but what we, what we do, what we did do is we, we developed the rootkit that, um, that, that is, could be the end result, that's the end result, right? So if you have a, if you have an exploit that you, 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 you use our rootkit and deploy on someone's phone, it'll be, it'll be highly effective. And there's other ways, right? So you have, you know, malicious apps that could be deployed that would be able to contain that rootkit on it. And so basically, you know, we, we chose Android, not because we don't like Android. Um, um, you, know, you know, Christian a, has an Android phone, I'm an iPhone user, but it was, there's no bone to pick with, with Android at all. Um, we, we chose it for our research basically because it runs Linux. Um, and, and everyone has access to the source code. Um, and that really, that really aided us in, in, our, in our research and be able to develop this. So let's get on to how we built our actual rootkit. Um, what our rootkit is, is a Linux kernel module. And what a LKM is, is, um, is, is, a, is a software that allows the kernel to be extended dynamically. So usually, if you, want, if you wanted, conventionally rather, to uh, extend your kernel's functionality, what you would usually have to do is um, write the code, recompile your whole kernel, and reboot your machine into that kernel to have it run. Um, LKMs allow you to flash kind of your kernel dynamically and get that functionality installed immediately. So as it's running in the kernel, it obviously has the same um, capabilities as code in the kernel. Um, and LKMs, uh, in our case, were hijacking system calls uh, used for file process and network operations. And these system calls are listed in what is called as a system call table. So imagine that's a big array um, with a whole bunch of system calls um, which are indexed by a system call number. So how does a kernel rootkit differ from a conventional rootkit? Well, early in the late 1990s or uh, early 2000, there was, like a, there was a couple of rootkits out there, one of which was something called TorrentKit. Uh, which replace system binaries like LS, PS, and Netstat. Um, the main 